Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian true crime cases and today we are covering another solved case and this case is one of Australia's most shocking for so many reasons. But before we get into it, I just want to ask you guys to follow me on my socials. I'll have the at linked here or on the screen, I should say, just so we can be a little more interactive together and you guys can vote on polls, give me your opinion, and we can sort of chat in between videos. And of course, if you enjoy my content, don't forget to subscribe. Having said that, let's get into today's case. Janine Kerry Boulding was born on October the 7th, 1967 in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, Australia. Her parents were Beverly and Kerry Boulding and she had a younger brother, 10-year-old David. In 1988, 20-year-old Janine was living in the beachside suburb of Cronulla in Sydney, famous for the beautiful Cronulla beaches, and worked as a bank teller on George Street, which is in Sydney's CBD. Janine was also engaged to her fiancé, Stephen Moran, and they had even picked their wedding date for March of the following year, 1989. The pair had also already bought their own home on the New South Wales Central Coast and had plans to start a family in the near future. September of 1988 was a very exciting time for Janine. Not only was her wedding fast approaching, but her 21st birthday was the following month. The 8th of September, which was a Thursday, was like any other day as they always are. Janine got to work, as many did, by parking her car at the railway station and catching a train into Sydney's busy CBD. On this day, she did just that. She finished work and caught the train back to her parked car at the Sutherland Railway Station, arriving around 6pm. Janine never made it home that night, however, and was soon reported missing to police. Days later, Janine Boulding's bound and lifeless body was found submerged in a dam on a paddock in the western Sydney suburb of Mitchenberry. It was clear that Janine had suffered in her final moments. What made the situation even more disturbing was the fact that it had been two boys, only 14 and 16 years old, that had led police to the body of Janine. These two boys were 14-year-old Bronson Blessington and 16-year-old Matthew Elliott. But I'll get back to them in just a moment. As the public came to learn exactly what had happened to Janine, an eerie sense of history repeating itself fell over Sydney. Only two years earlier, and just several kilometres away, Anita Cobby had met a very similar and equally as disturbing fate as Janine had. Those that know of the Anita Cobby case, which is probably one of Australia's most well-known cases, will understand just how terrifying it was for the public at the time, seeing a repeat of past events. I have actually covered Anita's case, but over on my old channel if you're wanting to check it out. Or better yet, I'm going to leave a link down below to a documentary about Anita's case called You Thought You Knew It All, which is just here on YouTube. And I highly recommend you watch this. It's going to give you an even better context to this case as well. So how and why did two kids, two teenagers, know where to find Janine's body? Well, Bronson Blessington and Matthew Elliott who, as it turned out, were just street kids who had really only just met, confessed to a youth worker that they had trusted in to an unrelated crime that they had committed on the same day that Janine went missing and was ultimately killed. Blessington and Elliot had beat up another street kid quite severely named Wayne Purchase. Blessington had punched Purchase and when he began to bleed, Elliot, who was high as a kite, apparently became triggered by the blood. Elliot then began to beat Purchase with a hollow sledgehammer, encouraging 14-year-old Bronson Blessington to do the same. 
Wayne Purchase did survive the incident and the matter was reported to the police. So how does this tie in with Janine's case? When Blessington and Elliot confessed to their trusted youth worker what they had done to Wayne Purchase, the youth worker reported the pair to the police. When the pair spoke with police, apparently unprompted, Blessington and Elliot informed police that they had details on missing woman Janine Boulding. At this time, Janine's body had not been found. They told police that she had been killed and they knew where to find her body. So naturally, police had the boys lead detectives to where to find Janine. They were led to a paddock where they were met with a horrific scene. However, according to Blessington and Elliot, they had no involvement in Janine's death and put all the blame on another street kid named Scott Agius, or Agius, who had indeed been with Blessington and Elliot when they beat Wayne Purchase, but had left soon after and had even tried to encourage 14-year-old Blessington to do the same. Unfortunately for Blessington and Elliot, Scott Agius also had an airtight alibi for the day that Janine was killed. So of course, now police are suspicious as hell of these two young street kids. But was it possible that a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old could commit such a horrific Act. Blessington and Elliot maintained their innocence. They never confessed, but they didn't have to because somebody else that had been there that day came forward. 22-year-old Stephen Shorty Jamison. Not quite a street kid, but he hung around with the street kids. Jamison, who had a very distinctive appear appearance as a result of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, meaning he was exposed to alcohol in the womb, came to police with his confession. Jamison told police that himself and four other street kids, three males and one female between the ages of 14 and 16 years old, had abducted, assaulted and killed Janine Boulding on September the 8th. As details of the case were revealed to the public, the ages of the kids involved shocked the public beyond belief. Five kids, bar 22-year-old Jemison, had been involved in Janine's death. And furthermore, the five of them had practically been strangers before coming together to commit one of Australia's worst crimes. So how and why did this happen? Well, we're gonna have to backtrack to the beginning of September the 8th and even further than that to see how and why the events of that day unfolded. So much of that day happened by chance and unfortunately for Janine Boulding, she had just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. So let's discuss the events leading up to the day that Janine was killed. I'm going to start with the youngest of the group, 14 year old Bronson Blessington. Blessington was fresh out of juvenile detention in early September and he was also fresh to living life on the streets. I'm going to sidetrack you here to give you some background on his upbringing. At the age of six, Blessington's parents got divorced, an event that he would later claim traumatized him. He lived in a caravan park for part of his childhood where Blessington claims he was assaulted by three different men. Two men that lived in the caravan park where he said they would corner him in the shower block. The other man was an acquaintance of his father. Blessington described what these men did to him as being so painful, he would sometimes pass out. By the age of 13, he was in his 13th school. Blessington struggled at school and was labelled illiterate. To cope with his home life and his school struggles, he began dealing drugs, skipping school, getting into fights and stealing. His father threatened to send him to a boy's home, but instead he was sent to an adult drug rehabilitation centre where he spent his days listening to stories from adults that simply were not appropriate for a 13-year-old's ears. 
At that time, a psychiatrist said that Blessington had the mental age of a nine-year-old. After his rehab stint, he was sent to the boy's home that his father had threatened to send him to, but it did little to improve his attitude. He spent most of his time getting in trouble with the other boys in the home. After his time was up in the boys' home, none of his family wanted him back. When he rang his mum begging to come home, she told him that he would have to prove himself. He had nowhere to go after this but a juvenile detention centre. And eventually, Blessington was pretty much living on the streets, where he celebrated his 14th birthday. Now, I don't tell you all of this information about Blessington so that you feel sorry for him or feel any sympathy. It is simply the facts, the backstory. So now let's go back to the day of September the 8th. Bronson Blessington got off a train at Sydney's Central train station. I'm gonna say it was around mid-morning, judging by the timeline, where a friend from juvenile detention introduced him to some more hardened street kids. These kids were 16-year-old Matthew Elliott, the same Matthew Elliott, mentioned earlier, and 15-year-old Wayne Wilmot. Elliot and Wilmot told Blessington they were in a feared gang and invited him to hang out with them at their squat. Blessington's new friends were impressed with his set of skills that included stealing and fistfights. This is when the incident occurred with Blessington punching a street kid Wayne Purchase, likely in an attempt to show off to his new friends. The blood, as I said, set off a very high Elliot, resulting in him attacking Purchase with the hollow sledgehammer. Blessington later recalls of this event that he thought he had killed Purchase. That was the level of severity in this attack. After this, Blessington, Elliot, and Wayne Wilmot, who had not been involved in Purchase's attack, met up with two more street kids at Sydney's Central train station. These were 15-year-old Carol and Arrow, the newest of the group to life on the streets, and the older and very distinctive-looking 22-year-old Stephen Shorty Jameson, who I mentioned earlier that confessed to police. Carol and Arrow, described as intellectually challenged, had recently run away from home and could be considered the most naive of the now group of five street kids that had come together that day. It should be noted that the group of five were virtually strangers before September the 8th, meaning that there was no friendship involved, no ties, connections, no loyalties and no planning that had gone into their day. The events that were soon to take place were pretty much a spur of the moment decision. Dumb, evil decisions made by majority kids. It was this next statement, allegedly uttered by Elliot and Wilmot, that shocked Australia. They suggested, why don't we get a Sheila and rip her? This statement was later denied by Blessington, who said the group's intention that day had been to steal a car. The group of five then spent the afternoon riding the train lines around Sydney, drinking stolen rum, taking speed pills, and causing general havoc. The group eventually got off the train at Sutherland Railway Station, where they found an unlocked car and attempted to start the ignition, but failed. The next suggestion by an unknown member of the group was to follow a woman to her car, forcefully take her keys, and then steal the car. Their first potential victim was a woman named Christine Mobley, who was walking to her car at the Sutherland Railway Station car park, the same place Janine had parked her own car, when she was approached by a group of rough-looking kids. One of the kids asked her for a cigarette, and this is when she noticed they were holding a knife. Without missing a beat, Christine quickly jumped in her car, and locked her doors. She proceeded to drive home and told her partner about the incident. Christine and her partner found the incident concerning, and I assume Christine must have been a little shaken up, 
because the couple then drove to the police station, the Sutherland police station, to report the incident. On their trip to the police station, Christine and her partner drove past the same train station car park in which she had been approached. When the couple peered over to see if the group was still loitering around the area, they spotted them approaching another female. This female was likely Janine. After Christine and her partner reported the incident, police immediately drove down to the Sutherland Railway Station car park to investigate the group of kids. Unbeknownst to the police, however, they were checking out the wrong car park. Police checked out the car park on the opposite side of the Sutherland railway station, instead of the one where Christine had been approached. It was a small mistake, but one that may have cost them just enough time to cause them to miss the troublesome group. By the time police realised their mistake and checked the other car park, Janine and the group were gone. I'm gonna try and keep the following details as tame as possible. I'm sure you can fill in most of the blanks. Those of you that are familiar with the Anita Cobby case will find the details of this case eerily similar. Janine was approached in her Holden Gemini when the youngest of the group, Blessington, asked her for a cigarette. Janine told him she didn't have one and this is when he pulled a knife out and threatened to cut Janine before ordering her into the back seat of her car. Elliot then got in the driver's seat of the car as the rest of the group loaded into the car with Janine and drove off. Janine was then driven down the F4, now known as the M4 freeway, heading towards the suburb of Mitchenbury in Sydney's west. During the drive to Mitchenbury, Janine was partially stripped and assaulted at knife point by Blessington, Jamison and Elliot, who had swapped out of the driver's seat, allowing Wayne Wilmot to continue driving. Wayne Wilmot and Carol Ann Arrow, the two 15-year-olds, did not partake in the assault. The assault continued upon the arrival to Mitchenbury, before the group dragged Janine from her car, bound and then gagged her. It was agreed by the group that out of fear of being identified, Janine must be killed. The group lifted Janine through a fence into a paddock and towards a dam. There, Janine was held down underwater by Blessington as Elliot punched her in the stomach so she would swallow water and die quickly, which is a quote by Blessington. Jemison also took part in the attack, although this is disputed later on, but I'll get back to that later in the video. Wilmot and Arrow did not partake in the killing. It was not long before Janine Boulding eventually passed away. The group then took Janine's jewellery and ATM cards and left her lifeless body in the dam. They then proceeded to withdraw some cash from Janine's bank card before abandoning her stolen vehicle. Reports stated different things when it came to how they obtained Janine's bank card pin number. Some say they forced Janine to tell them and others say she had it written down in her purse. Either way, they somehow got their hands on it. The group then went back to the city where they bragged about what they had just done to another street kid. The following day, Bronson Blessington and Matthew Elliott returned to the detention centre where Blessington had been staying just a week previous and this is when they confessed to a youth worker to beating Wayne Purchase with a hollow sledgehammer to within an inch of his life. As I mentioned earlier, police were notified and when they spoke to Blessington and Elliot, the pair mentioned, unprompted, that they knew where the body of a missing woman, Janine Boulding, was located, though they denied taking any part in the killing. Their story unraveled when the person they blamed had an airtight alibi, and the oldest member of their group, 22-year-old Stephen Shorty Jameson, confessed everything to police. After Jemison's confession, all five members of the group were arrested and charged in relation to Janine Boulding's abduction and death. They all went to trial in 1990, which was two years later, 
and they received their sentences. Bronson Blessington, Matthew Elliott, and Stephen Jamison all received life sentences plus 25 years. The two 15-year-olds, Wayne Wilmot and Carol Ann Arrow, got off with lighter sentences. Wilmot received a sentence of a minimum of seven years and a maximum of nine years and four months. And Carol Ann Arrow was released on a three-year good behaviour bond. This was due to the pair not partaking in the assault or the death of Janine. Matthew Elliott, who was 16 at the time of the killing, and Bronson Blessington, who was 14, the youngest of the five, actually became the youngest killers in Australia to ever be convicted for killing someone and receive the maximum sentence. Their killing was actually a point of debate and controversy in the media at the time, but Justice Newman defended his actions, stating at the sentencing, to sentence people so young to a long term of imprisonment is of course a heavy task. However, the facts surrounding the commission of the crimes are so barbaric that I believe I have no alternative other than to impose upon these young prisoners, even despite their age, a life sentence. So grave is the nature of this case that I recommend that none of the prisoners in the matter should ever be released. So let's talk a bit about what's happened since the sentencing of the group of five. Wayne Wilmot, who was 15 at the time of the killing and received the second lightest sentence of the group, went on to reoffend multiple times after his release from prison. He was charged over attacking a woman in 1998 and was sentenced in 2004 to 12 more years. A psychiatrist described him as quite incapable of engaging in rehabilitation. Wilmot himself admits it's likely he would hurt a woman again and feels triggered by their clothing. He is also one of the state's worst sex offenders. Just this past September, it was announced that he would remain in prison for at least another two years. As far as Carol Ann Arrow, the other 15 year old, I could not find any information on what had happened to her since, so I genuinely do hope that she has kept a low profile and kept out of trouble. The three that received life sentences remain in prison today, but not without issue. In 1997, 2001 and 2005, the New South Wales Parliament passed three pieces of legislation that Bronson Blessington, amongst others of Australia's worst offenders, never be released from prison for the rest of their natural born lives. In 2004, the United Nations Human Rights Committee found that the sentences handed down to Bronson Blessington and Matthew Elliott had breached the rights of a child. The committee requested that the case be reviewed to remedy the human rights breach. The committee said that any sentence handed down to that of a child must allow for the possibility of review and a prospect of release, notwithstanding the gravity of the crime and the circumstances around it. They continued, this does not mean that release should necessarily be granted. It rather means that release should not be a mere theoretical possibility. The committee described Blessington and Elliot's sentences of life in prison as cruel, inhuman and degrading punishment. So kind of like what they subjected Janine Bolding to? Hmm. As far as I could find, nothing did come of this review. Bronson Blessington has lodged appeal after appeal to be released from prison on the grounds that he was a child at the time of the killing. Blessington claims that he has since found God, don't they all, and said he is a changed man. In prison, he holds Bible study classes for his fellow inmates and counsels new inmates. Blessington even found love while in prison with a woman named Kim, who he met through his pastor's youth fellowship. 
They planned a life together outside of prison and the relationship actually lasted for 10 years before Blessington broke it off with Kim, telling her he believed he would never be released from prison and that she should go on without him. Despite all of this, the Balding family say that they have never received a formal apology from Blessington, who publicly claims that he is remorseful for his actions. The Balding family's stance is he deserves to be where he is and remain there for the rest of his natural born life. Blessington does have some supporters, however. Some feel sorry for the boy who will spend almost his entire life behind bars. Many believe he was a young kid that made a terrible mistake as a result of a troubled childhood. But let me know your thoughts below. And lastly, let's talk about Stephen Shorty Jameson, the oldest of the group at the time of the killing at 22 years old. The other four members of the group have all since stated at one time or another that Jameson was in fact not involved in Janine's killing. They all claim that another homeless man, also nicknamed Shorty, Mark Shorty Wells was the one that was with them on September the 8th. Mark Wells, a self-described psychiatrist and diagnosed schizophrenic, was located a year after Janine's passing. When he was questioned by police, Wells knew details of the case that were not public. But when he was asked about this in court, he claimed it was because of a dream conjured up during a seance. Mark Wells was never charged and Stephen Jemison maintains his innocence to this day, claiming the police confession was coerced. I did also read an article that claimed the DNA of both shorties was tested against the DNA found on Janine and neither Jemison's nor Wells' DNA was found on or in Janine. But take this information with a grain of salt. Janine's mother, Beverly, sadly passed away in 2013. Janine's father, Kerry, and youngest brother, David, are still with us and are vocal about their desires to see the men responsible for their beloved daughter and sister's death be kept behind bars for the rest of their lives. David stated regarding any chance of their release, governments and policies change, but hopefully these three will never see the light of day again. If there is any move to let them out, we will fight it all the way. In 1995, Beverly Boulding released a book titled The Janine Boulding Story, A Journey Through a Mother's Worst Nightmare that details her personal journey through the nightmare that was her daughter's passing and the harrowing events that followed. Beverly had also fought to bring back the death penalty in Australia after her daughter's passing but this never came to fruition. A plaque dedicated to Janine can still be found in Sutherland, where Janine was abducted, as a reminder to everyone that sees it that a young girl, only 20 years old, was taken from us under such horrendous circumstances much too soon. And that brings us to the end of today's video. Thank you so much for listening to Janine's story. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram to keep up to date. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on this video if you found it valuable or interesting. It really helps me out, especially when YouTube continues to demonetize my videos, pushing them out of the algorithm and out of the eyes of the viewing public. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye guys.